So here's the full list of literary devices that makes up Alice Pung's style. And don't worry about reading over my shoulder too much because I'll go through each one individually. So as each one is, ex is explained, you might want to take a note of what they are in your novel and you'll probably want to record the example provided to help you to understand not only what it means but what it will actually look like in the text because of, your, of course your job is to find more examples than the ones that I've provided here. So alliteration is just a repetition of vowel or consonant sound and the examples we've got here are Wars of Wonder, Proletariat Princess, uh, Lee and La Loiterers and Boxed Into My Blue Blazer. So pause the video, find these examples on the page and highlight them or write the name of the literary device next to them and then keep in mind when you're rereading for this purpose what alliteration looks like. So metaphor is comparing two things using a word like as to connect them. For example, her face, a stone mask. So go and find these two and then keep in mind where you might find your own examples of this in the story. Similes is the same sort of thing as metaphors, but typically using the word like. So I spread my stories around like Vegemite. Juxtaposition is when you put two things that are starkly different side by side to show the contrast. And you mostly want to be looking for juxtapositions towards the end of the novel and towards the beginning. So when they're discussing uh, sort of her fitting in with her boyfriend towards the end, and then also at the start when you talk about the family fitting into the new culture of Australia. This is probably the most complicated one, metonymy and synecdoche. So just like metaphor and simile, it's putting two things that are related close together. But for metonymy, the two words or the two phrases are related, but they're not actually part of one another which sounds complicated, but basically cynic doche is something like they called her big mouth because she always spoke. So her mouth is actually part of her and therefore it makes sense that it's cynic doche, whereas metonymy would just be saying something like referring to her as big talker. So they're related in that she does talk big, I guess, but it's not actually part of physically part of her or connected to her in any real way. So for metonymy, one giant leap for the wa is uh, they are wa'ers because that's what they say when they see something amazing, wa, uh, but it's not actually part of them. Whereas for our example for cynic doge, what we have is this discussion of her slender ankles and her crossed legs, and this is obviously part of the girl that they're describing, but it sort of represents her as a bigger aspect. So she's the polite, she's the well-mannered female in this role. The next two are closely related, but I've separated them out to sort of make it easier for you to show development through language of the sort of assimilation that is being discussed in the story. So colloquial Australian language is basically ockerisms, anything like get a mate, throw another shrimp on the barbie, that sort of thing. And it's not just necessarily coming from Australian characters, but you can see it's sort of seeping into their, the way all the characters in the story speak. And this is sort of a, a way that the assimilation or the level of engagement with the culture is shown in the story. Then idiomatic expressions. So this is very similar to the last one, but rather than sort of being uh, Aussie language, it's more idiomatic expression. So it's unique things like wa and ha. And so a stop gawking like a peasant or beautiful ha. So what you want to be keeping track of in the story is sort of when the ochreisms increase or the idiomatic expressions increase or decrease and sort of monitoring how often you're sort of annotating these two things and therefore what that indicates about the characters or the story itself. Then humour, obviously a lot of humour in this story is very dark or black, which basically means it's um, not happy, it's kind of quite risky, quite sort of on the edge of acceptable. So I mean, if you read the second quote down there, uh, Pol Pot basically committed genocide in Cambodia. So then to discuss Pol Pot in this sort of jokey, humorous way, as if it was uh, a meal you could order at a restaurant is obviously quite an example of dark humour. And it also shows up the differences between the Australian understanding of Pol Pot and Cambodia generally and also the immigrant population that directly came from Cambodia. For your characters you won't actually have to annotate necessarily but just keep in mind sort of especially referring to the front of the book where you have uh, the family trees of both families. Keep in mind what characters are similar or directly opposed to one another. Basically a foil is two characters that are the opposite sides of the coin. So one is evil, one is good, one is confident, one is shy, those sort of things. And a foil character is used to show sort of the opposite or the strengths and weaknesses of each character side by side, similar to a juxtaposition. And this is the last part of level three, uh, and it's still within authorial style, as it's something Pung does a lot. So intertextual references are referring to another text within your text, and the difference between it and an illusion is that it actually has the title of the story in it. So if you're going to 
apply yourself to this level of analysis. You'll actually need to do probably a minute or less of research on each of these texts and know really roughly what happens in that story or what it's about and therefore how that impacts or impacts on the characters or what it suggests about the plot or the story that you're reading. So for example, Dolly is a popular girls magazine uh, and it mostly focuses on sort of the insecurities of young girls. So if you're referencing Dolly in the story, then you're presuming that that section of the story has something to do with lack of confidence, growing up as a young girl or something related to that sort of topic. So at this step, I would pause it. I'd do a bit of research on each of these things. I'd also find them in your book and maybe just put a really brief little summary or note of what that story means and think about how that relates to the story overall or that section that you're reading. As noted, an allusion is just a reference to something. So a lot of these you won't find necessarily by yourself. You probably won't have the cultural cachet or understanding to find them yourself. So at least find these ones here and do again, two minutes or less, a little bit of research on what they are and therefore try and understand what the illusions mean and how they relate to the story.